Well, it is an honor to be back with our Pine Lake family, and I want to bring you a greeting from West Texas. I think what we say is howdy y'all or something like that, but we are super excited to be back with you this weekend. I love all of our folks, love all of our faith family, Clinton, Reservoir, Oxford, Madison, Starkville. We kind of feel like in West Texas, we're almost like the seventh campus because we're so rooted into this house. We love you. We love your leadership. I want to give a special thank you uh, to Chip and Tim, the elders and the staff here at Pine Lake for welcoming us back for this weekend. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about where God has had me over the last couple of months. Uh, Starting back in February, when we were planning our study for the summer, uh, the Lord directed us to put our attention on the little book of James. And so we just kind of started to study that book, and we felt like the Lord was telling us to glean wisdom out of those pages and paragraphs to build into our lives trusted truth that would help us during seasons of life where we felt like we were under pressure. Now, guys, that was weeks in front of all the things that have been happening over the last couple of months, and it's been amazing to see how on time God is as he's building truth, banking truth in our life that's helping us to navigate this season. So some of the things that we've been focused on as a faith family in Lubbock is how God can use these moments in our lives to bring maturity and grace and Christ's likeness to us. God doesn't waste a hurt. He doesn't waste a pain. He's working in all of that to bring gain out of our lives. And then we've also been able to see how we can have growth spurts even in these seasons and how pressure points can actually be like testing ground for us where we can see what we really believe. You know, we talk about what we believe all the time, but it's in those heated moments, those hard times, those difficult seasons where we find out what we really believe. We've talked about walking the walk, not just talking the talk, walking the walk, letting our faith be demonstrated with our actions, or as James would say it, faith without works, action is dead. Now, as we look at kind of some of the lessons that we've been learning, I want to to draw you to something in particular that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks, and it relates to our words. So it's important that we walk the walk, but we also need to talk the talk. And here's what I've noticed that can happen to us in pressure point seasons. Our talk, our words, can actually become the first casualties of our Christ-likeness. We can start to say things a little wonky, a little different than we might normally say because of the pressure. In fact, I had to have a little bit of a laugh to myself. I saw this T-shirt recently, and it said, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. And so that little, uh, that little shirt gave me a little bit of a laugh as I realized that all of us, when we are under pressure, we can find ourselves saying things that maybe are a little bit embarrassing to us. Maybe we kind of let off our steam uh, with a cuss word or two, or maybe we're thinking of ourselves in a little kind of Charlie Brown kind of way, a little bit of self-pity, like, man, nothing good ever happens to me. Or maybe our words get a little more angry, and so we can let off steam or pressure by saying things that are hurtful and abusive, or maybe even we play a little bit of a blame game. Who can I pin this on? So here's what I found. When we're under pressure, one of the first things that we can notice that's happening that's not very Christ-like is what comes out of our mouths. And so today I want to encourage all of us to steer like the pattern of our words in a more healthy and productive direction. Because one of the best things you can learn to do with your mouth when you are under pressure is bless. Today, I want to talk to you about the power of blessing, the power of blessing. You probably know this, but I want to remind you, your mouth was actually made to praise the Lord. Your your mouth was created in order to bless, and not just in the good times, but in the hard times. Listen to what God says to us in Romans chapter 12. He says, bless those who persecute you. 
Now, guys, I can't imagine a more difficult or stressful time than persecution. And yet God's expectation of us when we're walking through that moment is to use our words to bless. Bless those who persecute you. So we're to use our mouths to bless. Bless our spouse. Bless our children. Bless our school. Bless our community. Bless our nation. Bless our economy. Bless our church. Bless our leaders. God's expectation for us is that we will be blessers. Today, I want to talk to you about the power of blessing. Now, maybe you're thinking, what makes blessing such a powerful force? Well, listen to this. Here's what we're going to learn today. Whenever we kind of train our tongues to release blessing, one of the things that God does is he gets behind those words. God will put his weight behind our words so that his power, his honor, his integrity is behind what we say. So it's not just a birthday wish. A blessing is not a birthday wish. We're actually speaking something that's truthful and encouraging and positive. And God will put his weight behind those words so that those things that we speak actually will turn in the direction of reality. There is power in your blessing, God's weight to your words. I want you to see this in the scripture with me. So why don't you take your Bible and let's open them to the book of James chapter three. We're going to read through verses one through 12 this morning. So James chapter three, verses one through 12. Verse one begins this way. It says, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, notice as he starts to have this conversation with us about being more responsible in our words that he leads with this example of teachers. Now, in this case, teachers refers to those who have recognized responsibilities for teaching the word of God in church. And we know teachers use words. That's their tools. And so, He wants to point out, teachers, your words have influence. They can inspire. They can build people up. But also your words can tear down. If it's falsehood, you can tear people down with your words. Your your words have power. They have influence. Now, Jesus wanted to kind of weigh in with his own warning about our words and how accountable we should be for what we say. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus says this, I tell you. Now, anytime Jesus says, I'm going to tell you something, you know you got to be listening. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. That's sobering. So teachers, especially, we have to guard our words carefully because our words have influence. Uh, From time to time, I'll have people ask me, Chuck, why don't you like write more on social media? Why don't you share more of your opinion? Why don't, why don't you give us more of your thoughts on, you know, social media? And my answer is because of this verse, like I know my words have influence, but there's also a strict accountability over my words. I want to measure them carefully. And so for me, this is just for me, I've kind of decided that I have to have a higher regard for the influence of my words than I even do for the freedom of my words to say whatever I want to say. I have to guard my words carefully. Now, I think you could appreciate that as a teacher, that like that's my responsibility. You should. Teachers should be careful in what they say. Now, James anticipates that like the whole room is nodding like, yep, yep, yep. Teachers ought to watch their words. So he turns into verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. We all get hung by the tongue. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. The word for mature uh, is the word, or or excuse me, the word perfect is the word mature. And in James' day, it was a reference to someone who had like a a full-grown manness. They would call a full-grown man this word for mature or perfect. So if you're kind of looking at that, it's going to take some maturity, some some grownness, if we are going to take on the assignment of taming our tongue. Um, Several years ago, back in the 90s, the University of Arkansas was ranked number two 
uh, in the basketball polls. Number one was UNLV. And so they had a regular season matchup. The running Rebs came to Fayetteville, and so they, they sparred on the basketball court. It was a close game for a lot, but the best basketball player in college at the time by far was Larry Johnson. Uh, he's in this photograph in the middle, six foot seven, 260 pounds of muscle. He was beast mode, just a man among boys. And so as the game progressed, you know, these started to pull away specifically because of Larry Johnson. And so at one moment in the game, he drives the middle of the lane and just throws down this massive dunk. I mean, just hangs on the rim for a second and then kind of drops down and hits the ground. The whole crowd is just in awe of this, the strength of this dunk. And so he starts to kind of make his way back up court, but he, he trolls over by the Razorback bench. And as he's running by, he kind of side eyes the head coach, Nolan Richardson, And says to him, if you're going to guard me, you better go get some grown men. After the game, reporters were asking Coach Richardson what he thought about that. And he said, I thought, I better go get some grown men. (laughs) If we're going to take on our tongue, it's going to take some maturity. It's going to take some grown man effort, but I promise you, if we will lean into that discipline, there's even greater maturity that we can gain as a result of bringing our tongues under greater control. Now, James 3, verses 3 through 12, build out kind of a series of illustrations and examples to reinforce three things. And I just want to give you these three things right up front. The first one is he wants to help us kind of appreciate the power of our tongue. Guys, listen, your tongue, your words are powerful. They have the the ability to shape and direct and, and bring destiny into our lives. When you go back and read the creation narrative and you see how God creates, brings everything into being in the book of Genesis, remember what happens. God speaks and everything happens. God spoke and light appeared. God spoke and created all the different elements that we can appreciate in nature. God spoke it into being. His word had power. Now, in some way, in some way, God has shared with us a strength, a might, a power in our words that they can shape our lives. Your words have power. I want you to hear that today. If anything else, when you walk away from this message, I want that to haunt you. Your words have power. A second thing that James wants to point out in these remaining verses is how our sinfulness often kind of comes into play. And we can, we can be more negative than we are positive with our words, more hurtful than we are helpful. By default, we can just find ourselves Uh, buying into a lot of negative speak, a lot of destructive words. It's just easy for us to kind of fall into that pit. And so James uses some descriptions of our tongues to remind us of how they can be so hurtful. He's going to call our tongue a fire, a pollutant, a poison, evil. And then the third thing that he wants to help us with is as followers of Christ, For us to recognize how inconsistent we can be with our tongues and to call us into consistency, specifically in the direction of blessing. Yeah, yeah, we can say whatever we want. We've got freedom with our mouths. But he's hoping that we will opt more for blessing. Look at verse 3. He says, we can make a, a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. Now, I've been on a few cruises. Occasionally, I'll kind of look up a vacation on a cruise. I have never seen a cruise ship ever advertise its rudder. Have you? You'll see advertisements about maybe some dimensions of the ship, certainly the amenities of the ship and and the stops that they're going to take, but nobody ever recognizes the rudder. Nobody appreciates the rudder unless it does not deliver you into the promised ports of call. Then we may be concerned about 
the rudder. Notice how James is intrigued by how small things can have such a big influence on the outcomes. Look at verse five. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. The tongue is tiny, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Wars have been started, y'all, with words. I mean, great inspiring speeches have, have called forward a lot of incredible sacrifice. The, the tongue is a powerful force. It's a spark that can spread like a fire. Sometimes coaches are kind of known for their pregame and halftime speeches to kind of fire up their team. You may not know this, but I had a little side hustle for several years in my life. I was a football coach, and so during one season, I was a, a middle school coach. I think my best, like, pregame speech happened in an eighth grade year. Uh, our team was out on the, the field. We were warming up, and then the opposing team came out on the field to warm up. Holy smokes. We were little boys. They were like grown men on the other side. They were bigger, stronger, faster. Now, in my defense, two of the kids on that team are right now on NFL rosters. So th these, these were players. So I'm looking at the situation. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, we are in trouble. So we go to the locker room, get ready to come out before the game starts. And so it's time for me to give the, the pregame speech. And so I'm trying to think, what is my best David and Goliath kind of speech? And as the more I think about it, the more I'm like, why am I going to do this to these kids? So I walked into a room and I said, look, here, here's my, here's my halftime speech, or my pregame speech. Fellas, we will not win this game. <laughs> they are bigger, stronger, faster. There's, there's not one way that we line up and gain an advantage. So here's what I want you to do. Nobody in this stadium is going to have more fun than you. So just go out and have fun. Work on your technique. Work on your game. But if you get knocked on your tail, just get up and laugh about it. If somebody outruns you, just kind of, well, bless God, they've been given better wheels than me. Just, just laugh about it. And so they were so, like, like, surprised by that that there was like, a, you could see this joy and a bounce in their step. They were so loose, and they took the field. Guys, you know what happened? We got beat by 100 points. But I'll tell you, they were all leaving the field with a smile on their face, which actually felt like a win. You got to be careful because your words are like a fire and they spread. They are influential. Use your words wisely. Verse 6, he kind of turns us in a direction to see how destructive our words can be. He says, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body, your whole personhood. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Look at that. Look how interested the devil is in your words, how invested he is in your words. Hell is pulling out all stops to get us to make verbal mistakes because the consequences are so high. Notice this little expression, it can set your whole life on fire. The word whole is the word for a wheel. And in ancient times, a wheel was used to represent the entirety of life and like generations of life. As a wheel goes round and round, we go generation after generation after generation. Notice this, our words can be set on fire and have a negative impact for generations. In 30 years of pastoring people, I, I couldn't begin to summarize the stories of people sharing how words have shaped their families. I mean, it can be something silly like someone telling me one time, well, I'm a yeller. My mom's a yeller. My grandpa's a yeller. We're, our family's just full of yellers. That's how we communicate. We yell at one another. That's what we do to more serious stories where people sit down and tell me, you know, my, my mom told me I'd never amount to anything. And my whole life feels like it's been lived out 
under the shadow of those words. Our words can be set on fire by hell. They can affect the entirety of our lives. They can affect generations. Look at verse 7. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. You've been to the circus. You know how this works. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil and full of deadly poison. Now, let's, let's be clear. James is not making like an admission of futility, like what's the use? What he's really doing is he's setting the stage for a sobering warning for how much effort it's going to take to exercise consistent discipline over our words. That word restless, our tongue is restless. The word restless is the word for an inadequate animal cage. It's like somebody putting a bear in a cage and you look at that cage and you go, that cage is not going to hold that bear very long. Our tongue is restless. What does that mean? James is saying you can never have the confidence that you have fully domesticated your tongue to the point where you're never going to have an issue with your words again. Oh, no, friend. You're going to fight the fight of taming your tongue every day. Today, you may have some wins. Yay, I didn't cuss as much. But tomorrow, you're going to have to fight that fight again. Now, listen to how the back and forth plays out in verses 9 through 12. He says, sometimes our tongue, it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. So blessing, look at that word, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So James acknowledges the struggle that we all have with our tongues, but we would be best served to go back and look at a prior verse to see the choice that we have in the matter. Look at verse 4 one more time. It says, And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn. Notice these words, wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. See, there's a choice in how you use your words. And my hope today is many of us will choose to harness our tongue and release more and more and more blessing. You say, well, what does blessing mean? We can opt for just a real simple definition so that we can all be on the same page of what we mean when we say we want to bless someone. A blessing is using your words to create clarity through truth. So you're not just kind of giving motivational speeches. You're not just kind of giving quotes. You're actually giving voice to truth, scripture, what is real, what is right. There's clarity of truth. It inspires hope. And then notice this, a blessing also draws in spiritual authority behind what you say. This is what I want you to see today. You probably had kind of a suspicion that blessing would be clarification of truth. It's, it inspires people to hope, but not many people think about the spiritual authority that comes with your blessing. What that means is whenever we speak a blessing, when we say something truthful, when we say something hopeful to people, that means that, listen, God Almighty puts himself into the mix of our words. It's almost like our blessing becomes like the air traffic control tower that puts everything on pause and, and waves God into, come on, God, land on these words. God brings his power, his integrity, his honor behind what we say so that it moves our words in the direction of truth. There is power in your blessing because God gets involved with your words. Some of us might remember a story in the Old Testament, Isaac, one of the patriarchs. And so his sons are to receive his blessing. One of his sons, Jacob, tricks his father into 
getting him to give him his blessing. Esau, the older brother, was entitled to receive the blessing, but because of Jacob's finagling, he got it. Now, when the jig was up, what we expect is for Isaac to kind of come to the point of saying like, oh, oh, wait a minute, you tricked me. The deal is off. But instead, he makes this kind of peculiar observation. He says, son, I would like to kind of reverse things, but I can't. What, what I've blessed and what I've spoken, I cannot withdraw. Now, I think there's a lot of things happening in that that we don't fully understand, but it's an incredible picture of someone who understood that once he blessed, once he brought clarity and hope and invoked spiritual authority, when he got God involved with his words, he said, I can't you turn that. God has already leaned in and moved on my words. God is already working to bring to pass the blessing that I have provided. I cannot withdraw it. Come on, guys, there is power in our blessing, and we need to be blessers. Now, I want to give you a couple of guide points, because if you want to pick this up and you want to practice, you want to harness your tongue and tame it and start to release more blessing than cursing, let me give you some guide points to help you with that. Here's the first one. First one is just be more available for, for blessing. I mean, make time for it. Make room in your life for it. We, we are all so busy and so distracted that we miss so many moments when we have the opportunity to be a blesser in a situation. So I'm going to call us to be more available, to prioritize, to be more aware of the opportunities that God gives you to speak into and to bless. Number two, I want you to be purposeful. Be available. Look for opportunities to happen, but be purposeful. In other words, say some things on purpose. You say, well, this is where I really kind of get tripped up because I don't know what to say or to do. Well, I'm going to help you with that. Recently, I put together a, a resource to, to help our people, to help me be able to practice this more routinely. And so we came up with a seven-day blessing guide. That resource is going to be available. You can download that. You can get a hold of that so that it can help you walk this out over the next seven days. But we set a target for each day. The first day is courage. And so we want to inspire and to call you into being a blesser in someone's life with courage. You say, well, who? Well, it could be anybody. It could be your spouse. It could be your child. It could be a coworker. It could be somebody randomly that God brings into your path. You say, well, you know, what's the, what's the avenue that I say that? Well, it could be something very personal. You could speak a personal word, look them eye to eye and say, I want to bless you. It could be a text. It could be an email. It could be a phone call. There's so many different ways that we can do it. We just got to do it. You say, well, okay, then like, give me, give me a script. Give me a little help on that. Okay. So on that resource, for example, day number one is courage. And so you could Bless someone with like uh, an encouraging thought about courage. You can look at your child and say, you know what? When I see you do this, man, that's, that's courageous. And I want to bless you to be more courageous. You could share this scripture verse with them. I just want to, I want to read this verse to you. I want to bless this truth in your life. You could pray for them. There are so many different ways to express blessing. But my encouragement is be available and then be purposeful. Finally, I want you to be transparent, be real, be vulnerable. You, you don't have to be perfect. You can just be authentic. Be yourself. I mean, you can even, with courage, you can even say to someone that you're blessing with courage, you know, I haven't always been courageous but I want to bless you with courage. Listen, friend, in the end, it's not about you anyway. It's about connecting them with the one who can put weight to their words. It's the Lord, the Lord who is courageous. Be authentic, be real, be purposeful, be available. 
Now, let's land this plane. And I want to challenge you with these three takeaways. This is what we've been learning today. Number one, I want you to be super convinced that your words are powerful, and I want you to be more intentional with your words. Nobody walks away today thinking, man, my words don't matter. No, no, no. Your words matter. Be intentional with your words. Here's the second thing, is I want you to move in the power of blessing. Friend, I want you to own this. I want you to move in this, not static. It's not one and done. I want you to move in this. Make this a part of your life, looking for those opportunities where you can speak blessing and pull the almighty spiritual authority into what you say. And then finally, this is where we really need to to land. Some of us probably need some healing in our tongue. We need God to heal our tongues. You know, hell can set our words on fire, but hell's not the only place where there's a fire. The Bible says that there is a fire in the presence of God. There's an altar before the Lord, and that altar burns hot. And there's one story in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah where a prophet experiences the presence of the Lord, and he's so overtaken by the moment of experiencing God's presence. This is what he says in Isaiah 6, verses 5 through 8. Woe to me, Lord, I am ruined. Look at this, for I'm a man of unclean lips. The prophet would cuss a little. The prophet maybe had some self-pity in his words or some blame in his words. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim, an angel, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, look at this, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Like Isaiah, there might be some of us who feel like this moment is about making a confession that I need God to heal my tongue. Maybe some of us are thinking, <clears throat> maybe some of us are thinking that where we need the healing is just our mouth has not been a clean place. Some of the things that we say, the words that we choose and how we use them, it's more hurtful than it is helpful. And maybe some of us just, just know, like, I, I, need the, come on, I need the Lord to touch my mouth. I need God to clean up my lips. And some of you, that's your confession. That's where you need healing. That's where you need help with your tongue. Maybe some of us find ourselves in a place where we need the Lord to purge, listen, some of the words that we've spoken. You need God to step in and to help you with some things that you said that you would love to take back. You would love to pull some of the sting out of those words, but you don't know how. And so the promise of God is that he can, listen, he can touch that coal to your lips, purging some of the words that we've spoken. Yeah, we may have to own it. We may have to apologize, but God can take some of the sting out of those words. My grown son, a little less than a year ago, had to sit me down, 27 years old, and look at me and say, Daddy, when you said such and such, it hurt me. There was a moment for me to recognize how my tongue had been used to hurt my own flesh and blood. And I had to ask Jesus to help me. God, will you purge that word out of my family? Maybe some of you today, that's exactly what you're feeling. You have a sense of conviction that there's been some words that have been shared. You need Jesus to purge some of those words out of your family. Or maybe where you need to confess and receive healing is you've allowed your life to be built around a curse. And some of the things that have been spoken over you and into you have been controlling your life. And God is calling you in this moment to receive his healing 
to come up out of that word and to receive his word. What does God say about you? What does he think about you? What has he called you to be and to do? So your confession is about receiving healing so that your life comes out from under a curse and you can start living in the blessing. I want to pray for us. But as I do, I want you to lean into this moment and really consider bringing the power of your tongue under harness and let God use you to be a blesser. Let's pray together. Lord, all across our campuses, online, we're sensing the moving of your presence, that your holy presence is identifying in us the strength and the power of our tongue. Lord, many times we're dismissive with our words. We don't consider the weight of our words. And so today we understand it's important that we walk the walk, but also that we talk the talk. And so we invite you, Holy Spirit, to bring conviction where it needs that we could respond with confession and the reception of healing. Lord, heal our tongues today. Liberate us. Free us so that we can be a blesser. Lord, we confess we have unclean lips. We dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, and we want to come out from among them. We want to be blessers in Jesus' name. So we commit ourselves to that course. In our Savior's name, amen.